Hearth and pine, pine and hearth. This is our song. Now we're going to start. Hello. Welcome back to Hearth and Pine. I'm Mac. I'm Tyrone Dayhawk Night Hammock. The week before last, we talked about emergency kits and bug out bags. Last week, we talked about how to plan for weather and what to do. And we shared some stories about our bad experiences with weather. This week, we're going to talk about why it's important to plan in general, and also why it's important to reserve room for spontaneity. I have not always been the best planner. However, over the last couple of years, I have started seeing the benefits of putting together a good plan. When I started out, my planning was pretty basic. When it came to hiking or camping or things like that, it was... What time, what day, and where. There wasn't a lot of thought into supplies, how I'd get there, what was going to be needed, any of that kind of stuff. This type of basic planning tends to create pretty chaotic situations, which at a younger age, in my 20s, was not really a problem because when you're in your 20s, all of life is chaos, and it's enjoyable. Nowadays, not so much. And over the years, I've slowly begun to learn to be a better planner, but I have I have a long ways to go before I'm at the point I'd like to be with planning. It's been a step-by-step process, basically thinking I'm ready, going out and finding that I am not ready or fully planned, I guess. Then the next excursion, planning and preparing as far as supplies go, as far as map details go, as far as transportation goes, getting all this stuff ready, and then getting out there and realizing I hadn't planned for something else to come up. It's been kind of a trial and error process. There's still constant times where we'll go out on a hike or we'll go camping or something, And halfway through the excursion, something I didn't plan for. And it's usually something basic. This isn't something like an alien abduction. This is like, oh, I didn't plan to bring enough toilet paper camping. Or I didn't plan on needing bug spray, even though we're going to a place that's full of mosquitoes. (laughs) Really just basic things that should have been planned for that weren't. When we talk about planning, it's not just thinking about the logistics. Tyrone is talking about things that are categorized as items. And while you might not consider that part of planning, it is about preparation. So preparation and planning go hand in hand. So bringing items like bug spray or forgetting to plan for the bugs, that's just another way of having a solution to a problem that has not yet happened. Being proactive versus reactive. And that's what planning and preparation is about, is about being proactive about the things that might happen, making sure you have a tool or a piece of equipment or a a thought process that will help you mitigate the situation, even though it may not directly fix or resolve the situation. So Tyrone, what's making you want to plan more? Like, Tyrone was mentioning that he doesn't see value. Well, no. Didn't see value. No, I don't want to say see value, because there's value in chaos. True. There is value in chaos and experiencing chaos. However... His chaotic period of non-planning was in his 20s. So, Tyrone, what kind of chaos or chaotic moments like the ones you experienced in your 20s are you trying to avoid now by being a better planner? You may be able to hear my cat purring right now. Oh boy. And my dog chewing on a bone, but we have to continue recording. (laughs) <laughs> so, so I'm sorry if this causes you some discomfort. 
we have other videos that you might enjoy with purring and bone sounds not included. Anyway, Tyrone has a story for us. Yeah, this is a good story from before I saw the benefits of planning. My mother, my cousin Amy, hi Amy, and myself were on a trip in Arizona. We we're heading from the Grand Canyon back to Phoenix, and along the way, we're looking for different places to stop. We had just come from a nice river walk, and we were going through, I think it was Scottsdale. We ended up finding a place to hike known as the Devil's Bridge. When we got there, we were under the impression that it was just a four mile round trip hike. So my mother and I decided to start out on the trek. My cousin Amy was pretty tired from pulling late shifts, decided to stay in the car. There was zero planning involved from here on out. We were content and ready to go, grabbed our 16 ounce bottles of water, and headed in. On the way into the trail, we completely passed the sign, which would have told us it was actually a nine and a half mile long hike. It was four miles from the Jeep trail. We were not in a Jeep, and we were not taking the Jeep trail. After about a mile, we began asking people how far it was. And of course, we were given the traditional hiking, you're almost there. Now if you do this to people, and they're not anywhere near where the end of the trail is, you are a terrible, terrible person, and I despise you greatly. So we end up continuing on. I am way overdressed for the 85 to 90 degree heat without enough water to sustain myself or my mom for nine and a half miles. Finally getting to the Jeep Trail parking lot, we realize we are actually almost there. So we go up to the Devil's Bridge, we take pictures, come back down. And this is where a little bit of planning actually helped out. We stopped and looked at the map in the Jeep parking lot and found that the Jeep trail was actually a nice wide road that led straight back to the parking lot, as opposed to the winding trail we had hiked along that does not go straight back to the parking lot. We took the Jeep trail and along that walk back realized we weren't the worst planners there. We actually passed a bachelorette party who had just come fresh from the hangover to hike out to the Devil's Bridge in flats and pretty much looked like what they were wearing the night before. They had zero water with them and they were struggling. But as far as I know, they made it back to the parking lot. We made it back to the parking lot and realized a lot of the mistakes we had made. We did not have enough water. We did not see how long the trail was, we did not look at the temperature and weather, and at no point, which was the worst thing, we did not set up a time to return to the parking lot with my cousin in case of an emergency or in case we weren't back at a certain time, she'd be able to call for help or go to search for us. Now we survived perfectly fine, it's a great memory, but it's something I never want to have to do again. What did Amy end up doing for those hours that you were gone? Uh, she worked on some of the stuff. Amy's a nurse, and so she worked on some of the paperwork that she had, and I believe she was taking some classes. So she worked on that and then napped. But it was 99, it was like in the 90s. Oh, she had the car with air conditioning on. So she had it running the whole time. Not the whole time. Plus, she lived down there, so she was used to the heat. Okay, this okay. Was This was February in Arizona, and according to them, like, 70 and 80 degrees is cold, (laughs) which it's not. I'm assuming that you did a a 10-mile hike in four hours. It was about four hours. So, if you were gone for longer than one hour, any person that's not used to that weather is going to have the AC going, which means you're running through your gas a lot. Yeah, that doesn't really sound like a great time. I'm sure it was pretty, but it doesn't sound like a great time to be partially dehydrated and lower on gas than you thought you were going to be. Yeah, my mom was pretty much ready to kill me by the end of that hike. (laughs) (laughs) Honestly, I I can't um, pinpoint when I started really planning. I just know that due to financial constraints... I had to be very picky 
with where I went and when I went. I couldn't take big long trips. Um, I The only times I ever went on road trips were when I was moving somewhere. I've moved from Wisconsin to North Carolina, North Carolina to Wisconsin, Wisconsin to Montana, Montana to California, and California to Washington. So a lot of cross-country road tripping. But I really do think that planning for adventures got so in-depth for me because of my need to financially plan in the beginning, like when I didn't live with my parents anymore. So back in 2010, when I left for college, that's when I really started planning things, but only as it related to how much gas I needed to get from place to place. So my need to plan stems from a need to budget. I'm still pretty fucking poor, and there's only a certain amount of places that I can go based on the gas mileage it requires to get there. The other things that I've learned throughout the years that is additional to my planning includes the amount of equipment that I need to be proactive about potential scenarios. And that is where vetting your equipment comes in, which I mentioned in the last episode. I do it with every single piece of equipment I have because it's part of my planning process. It's how I find the most affordable, efficient, and durable equipment to take with me in order to anticipate, regulate, and mitigate any issues I might come up against. <laughs> Three gate rule. Lots of gates. Three gate rule. Remember that. <laughs> Uh, mitigate. Uh, I said front gate, back gate. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why I vet all these products, equipment, and tools is because I want to be able to handle whatever situation I might come across in the most appropriate manner instead of being completely and totally unprepared. So, as a planner, what is it like to travel or adventure with people who don't plan appropriately? It's frustrating as fuck. <laughs> like, there's a difference between being spontaneous and just not, not caring about what you're going into or the people around you. To me, the people who don't plan appropriately come from a place of privilege. They've never experienced anything shitty. They've never had to deal with the consequences. They've never had to pay out of pocket for whatever thing that happened. They just seem amazingly privileged to not have to worry about any of the things. And I know that there is a difference between monetary privilege and psychological privilege. Some people are just super carefree and they're like, fate is going to bring me whatever it wants and I will go with the flow and deal with it. And those are the people that you hate in the movies that you're like, why are you doing that? <laughs> They're also the ones that don't pay attention to how their attitude affects the people around them. Not everyone is super carefree and can go with the flow because they have circumstances that they need to deal with when this particular situation is over with. You know what's a really good example of that? What? The Descent. That's the cave movie, right? Yeah, the cave movie where it's a bunch of women that go rock climbing down. Some of them are prepared. Some of them are unprepared. Some of them are trusted with, like, the GPS and directions and the car keys. <laughs> and then they run into monsters. And the people who are unprepared completely and totally die. And then the person who is most prepared survives. Like, yes, you can consider that to be luck, but... <laughs> and maybe that's not exactly how the movie went, <laughs> but I still think The Descent is a really good example of how, how certain personality types don't have the self-awareness to remember that other people are affected by the decisions you make. I, I kind of want to know, Tyrone, if, um, if you've ever been impressed by the quality and care of things that I put into my pack. Like, has there ever, have we ever been on a hike where you, <laughs> I keep saying impressed, like, stroke my ego here. Were you ever impressed by something that I brought? 
in general on our hikes, like some of the first hike we went on, something I had sadly never seen with any of the other hikers I've been with, uh, you had your bear spray, and we were going <laughs> into bear country, which you know, kind of makes sense. But again, never seen that planned out by anybody else. Whether they had it, they didn't have it out where they could actually get to it, like you had it ready to go, in a holster, easily accessible. That blows my mind. Yeah, so I felt a lot safer doing, you know, hiking with you <laughs> at that point, knowing, like, well, they're prepared. Uh, the other big thing I was impressed with is the planning you put into the geography and the weather and how they affect each other. Not just snow, but more in-depth stuff. So having hiked with multiple people years before you'd moved out here and we met, there was never any thoughts on landslides even when we were going into areas that were prone to landslides there was no thoughts on avalanches any kind of major catastrophes that are pretty much unescapable and we would constantly go into these areas and go hiking devil may care i myself am guilty because at no point did i suggest like hey guys there was a landslide here four days ago should we not do this? <laughs> now that I've been hiking with you, I see the error there, and it's good to have you to plan that, because even now, seeing that error, there are still plenty of times where I'll pull up, I want to do this trail or that trail, and have no thought towards, there's a high chance of avalanche there right now, or there's a big chance there's going to be a landslide due to the rain we've had, or there's a massive forest fire two miles away from there, <laughs> probably don't want to go. None of, you know, I still have my moments of lack of awareness. And so having you around, you know, this is kind of like the opposite of you having to deal with people who are not properly planning or properly prepared, where I have the benefit of you being around to properly prepare and look at the bigger scheme or the bigger picture and judge whether that's a good idea or maybe let's take it easy this weekend and find something else. Well, that makes me feel good. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, planning is not easy and sometimes I feel like I do it too much and I'm worrying too much. And it's entirely possible to feel burnout when you plan everything out. And those are the days when you need to allow yourself to be spontaneous. And sure, that spontaneous day may just happen to be super sunny and nice out with no wind. <laughs> but that's what makes spontaneous days great. So before we go into that, I want to tell a story about a couple years back. I was living in Montana and one of my friends and I went, went canoeing to... Holland Lake, Montana. We were at a campsite, staying there for three days, and we had coordinated with each other to figure out who was bringing what so that we didn't overpack. I was in charge of food. So the night before, I set up two playmates full of food, one for her, one for me, and a bag of dry food, like snacks and stuff, to bring on the trip. I wake up the next day, surprisingly on time, but when I'm finishing up packing up my car, I notice that I'm low on gas, and I start to worry about how much time that's going to eat into me meeting up with her. So we get to Holland Lake. We start to fill up the canoe. We paddle across the lake to our campsite, and we're like, oh wow, it's getting near like 1 p.m. We should eat. I left the Playmates a whole $120 of food, fresh from the grocery store, in my fridge back home, three hours away. Ouch. Yeah, so this is a, <laughs> this is a really great example of no matter how much you plan and have your shit together so that things go the right way, <laughs> something can always go wrong. Isn't that Darwin's theory? Murphy's Law. That That's what it is. Yeah. It's a, like, no matter how much you plan, 
If something that can go wrong <laughs> will. Go wrong. <laughs> Murphy's Law. So uh, that's why it's always good to, to, gosh dang, just be aware of what's happening and what's going on. Check off your lists. Take don't, a breath every now and then. Yeah, don't rush because you'll forget something. Like right there, think about that. I'm late by 15 minutes because some old geezer fisherman took forever to fill his boat and I had to get fuel, but I have our lunch. Or I'm on time, but don't don't have have our our lunch. lunch. (laughs) But the way that we fixed that problem that I caused (laughs) was by finding one of the best mom and pop pizza shops I have ever been to. It's closed now, unfortunately, because of COVID. It was teeny tiny little mom and pop shop. But we found some of the best pizza because of <laughs> of my hiccup. That's a great lead into the importance of spontaneity and why too much planning just isn't always good. At the beginning of the episode, I mentioned how I'm working on becoming a better planner. One of the other things I lack is spontaneity. <laughs> Especially with hikes and adventures and things of that sort. I uh, tend to play it safe. I rely solely on being funny to make the adventures good time. You want to be invited and included. Yeah, basically. I make it easy for people to bring me along. He makes it easy for people to want him around. Yeah, I'm like a show. (laughs) We did a road trip in 2020, and I was trying to be spontaneous, and on road trips I have been. The problem with the most recent road trip was everything I wanted to do was closed due to COVID. All the nifty little gold mines, the tourist stops. We also missed out on the Bordello Museum in Wallace. Because, well, basically Wallace, Idaho was shut down completely. There weren't even people on the streets. It was kind of creepy. I want to go there still. (laughs) One day. I don't know what a Bordello Museum has, but I want to see it. Later on in the trip, there were some things where I tried to be spontaneous. And unfortunately, timing-wise... That didn't work out either, because it was just too late in the day, and we either needed to get where we were going, or it was already closed due to operating hours. So, I'm trying to get more spontaneous and get better at it anyways. It really just turned out to be a bummer that all these places were closed, despite the desire to be spontaneous. So the planning worked out, but we were let down in a small number of ways because we were trying to be spontaneous and because our expectations were not met. We did so much planning for this road trip because it takes 36 hours to get from the one point we started to our end point. 36 hours is a long fucking time to plan. If you don't make time to do something fun... Your road trip that is 36 hours long, even though it went off without a hitch, you're going to look back on it on those moments and remember nothing but blacktop. Spontaneity allows for those chaotic situations from your 20s to weave their way back into your life. You definitely have to have a balance between... never yawns and then does that Mm -hmm. you definitely have to have a balance between order and chaos in your adventures for example that road trip we remember the most chaotic moments throughout the entire thing more than anything else those were spontaneous moments that we did not provide yeah there are 28 of them I wasn't counting, but I guess 28. That's uh, that's a lot of chaos. Yeah, I was counting. I went through and I counted all because I'm the planner of the duo. And uh, there were 28 instances of chaos. Yeah, I think we probably made the uh, National Lampoon road trips look <laughs> like paradise compared to what we did. <laughs> yeah, those 
um, 28 instances don't really instill the importance of spontaneity, considering they were all bad. But there are a lot of times when being spontaneous is really amazing. We've found some fantastic restaurants by being spontaneous. Yeah. We'll go for a drive, like, in order to get anywhere, we have to drive an hour. So I was like, hey, you want to go for a drive? Tyrone says, yeah. Then we go to the place and be like, hey, we're hungry. We're going to get food. (laughs) That's a really great story. I know. I have better ones. I promise. This last summer, we had intended on going on a hike up to the Canadian border. The place we wanted to go ended up having like 50 vehicles lined up on one side of a single lane fucking road. There were just so many cars on such a steep road. Switchback upon switchback upon switchback. So Very narrow. It was sketchy. So we kept going on the road. It it kept going, and I kept driving. We both were like, nope, we're not going to do this particular hike. So we kept driving up the road. We did stop on, like, every corner to get out and take a picture. Because we, we didn't know how much further up we could go. So and, Yeah, <laughs> and we realized that every single corner of that picture was the same as the one 30 feet below us on the last <laughs> corner. And I think that's when we started actually... Kind of just let's get up and see where this yeah, goes. Yeah, we're like, all right, enough of this. We're wasting a lot of time and air conditioning. So we kept driving. We come across two alpine lakes where there is a shit ton of camping, fishing, no motorized boats. And we see that there's a sign for two hikes to choose from. Two hikes that we had not looked into or heard of before, but it was a beautiful day. 10.30, 11 a.m., We had plenty of time to get something done. So we decided, well, fuck it. Let's go on the trail that it looks like less people are on. And we can see a bunch of people up on the mountain in front of us. You could choose to go to the really busy mountain to your left, or you could choose to go to the not-so-busy trail on your right. I could only tell how less trafficked it was by the amount of dust settled on the leaves of nearby plants. We agreed that taking the left which was in the shadow of a mountain, seemed like a better option. Wherever it went, we'd figure it out, and it ended up being one of the most amazing hikes I've ever been on. Yeah, that's probably one of my most memorable. We made it to the top of a mountain with a mine below it, three alpine lakes, and we were high enough that we could see the Canadian Rockies and the ocean. And the curvature of the earth. We were like 5,000 million miles in the air. (laughs) Pretty sure. Yes. I was terrified. Along the trail that we had taken, it was more switchbacks, which I took relatively slow at first, but thankfully there was somebody to poke me and tell me to hurry up. And we made it to the top of the switchbacks. Nice big open field. Then the trail continued. It was a gorgeous saddle between the mountains. Not just one of the saddles that you see in Glacier National Park or in the Rockies, it was big and broad and like you were in the Alps kind of a saddle between mountaintops. Yeah, like when, uh, what's her name is singing, The Hills Are Alive. The Hills Are Alive. That one. Like the Alps there without the Nazis. There was just an annoying family. So the trail continued on from there and went up quite a steep hillside straight up straight yeah up the option was presented to me do you want to go up there or should we stay here and have lunch and against all of the voices in my head saying there's no fucking way you're going to get me up that thing on top of that peak hell no i decided to agree to it and i said well how about we just get up to that one point And we'll see how you feel. (laughs) Yeah. Take advantage of the, I'm here now. I'm going to continue going to the top because I don't want to go backwards and have to look down. When I was going up that hill, my thought was, if I have to turn around at any point, I am then going to have to look down. (laughs) And looking down is not what I want to do. 
if I continue going forward and continue looking up, I can completely block out how terribly high we are getting. <laughs> Until I get to the top and realize, shit, now I have to go back down. <laughs> but we made it. We enjoyed a snack, had our celebratory beers, and took in the view. I stayed as far away from the edges as I possibly could. Did my best to smile for a picture. I... Oh, he looked angry. Like, on the way up, at one point, I think he said, stop talking to me, because I need to focus. Yep. Yeah, I definitely had to just, like, be focused <laughs> on each little piece of dirt in front of me, and that was the only thing that existed, was me and that single piece of dirt. <laughs> there was not a massive hill behind me. And... Mountain! It's not a hill! Yeah. Mountain. Mind you, it was all loose gravel. There wasn't much of a trail there. There it was, was. It was just all washed out. Scramble. The particular stretch of trail we were on couldn't maintain the shape of a switchback because of its orientation to the ocean. It was, it was just a very sand. It it was constantly eroding. So it was a very sandy trail. That's all you need to know. Wow. While we were up there, you could definitely get views of everything. I think we saw Rainier. I never saw Rainier. You didn't see Rainier? No. I thought we did. There was multiple mountain peaks that we saw. Adams, St. Helens, Everest, Kilimanjaro, that one that's in Hawaii. We could see that too. Mount Vesuvius, if you remember from my last history lesson. You didn't see that one? Keep here? going. <laughs> Definitely great mountain views everywhere you looked. You could continue on if you were a mountain goat or an idiot, and there were people that decided to do that, which at one point I had to stop watching because of the anxiety that it was causing me. They looked like they might know what they were doing, but that still gives me massive anxiety. So what exactly made this decision to continue up worth it? Like I said before, there's no the voices in my head were saying there's no way in hell I'm going up there. And without a push from you, it's a place I would have never seen. I, my feet would have never stepped in the places that they did that day. There's no way. It was pretty spectacular. It was just so amazing to me that there were two guides, two ravens, if you don't know a guide, two ravens that met us up there and started circling around us as Tyrone's emotions were settling and as my breath was catching Every physical and metaphysical manifestation came together at that point in time to greet us at the top. It felt wonderful. Yeah. So would you say that the introduction of chaos at a moment in time that you did not expect it changed you? Benefit or alter your perception of your capabilities? I mean, what I'm asking is, did you notice a change in yourself after you did something you didn't think you would accomplish? Yeah. The fear was gone. That's something I think I I found at a younger age, but kind of disregarded. Like, going on a roller coaster, the first time I'm terrified, second time is not as bad, third time, whatever. This is kind of like that, where it was like, now that I've done this... And I've seen the beauty that I was missing. I found that it's not as terrifying as I thought it'd be. When I'm presented with these opportunities now, I don't have so many voices screaming, hell no, we're not doing that. Mind you, I'm not at the point where I am the one suggesting these <laughs> adventures quite yet. And I may never get there, but I am a lot less likely to turn them down today than I was a year ago. Speaking as the planner of us, of the two of us, spontaneity is really beautiful and really beneficial. It's a little redundant, but it's something you don't want to miss out on because you don't want to miss out on other things. Let spontaneity exist where it needs to exist. If you have an opportunity to do something spontaneous, just do it. Not everything has to be planned. Most things should be planned, but <laughs> not everything has to be. And if your plan doesn't go the way you hoped, 
nothing wrong with sprinkling in a little chaos. Makes you feel alive, and you never know where it might take you. Maybe to encapsulate this episode, it's a lot of being proactive versus reactive, and being a planner and being self-aware with a healthy dose of spontaneity to balance it. So if you take anything away from this podcast after listening to us for, remember that, as cliche as it sounds, find chaos in the order. (laughs) I hope you liked that. (laughs) That wasn't rehearsed at all. No, not at all. We totally finish each other's sentences all the time. Mm Mm-hmm. Just like right now. What do you mean, like, right now? Like, right now. See, I just finished that (laughs) sentence. You didn't finish the sentence! (laughs) You talked at the same time as me! That's, like, the same thing. Yeah, 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 okay. I think that's about it for this episode. I'm gonna go let my brain rest. Thanks for listening to another episode. I'm your host, Mac. And I'm Tyrone Dayhawk Nighthammock. (laughs) We'll see you next time. Stay classy. Cue the song. Hearth and pine, this is the end. Love you to come back and be our friend. friend.